Today, I'll be talking about new results about reset indifferentiability. To motivate things, consider the following. Bob goes to Alice saying, look at my great new hash function. Alice is skeptical as any cryptographer would be. She therefore asked Bob to prove security under a widely believed mathematical assumption, the gold standard of modern cryptography. Bob points out that for much of practical symmetric crypto, the community does not have such proofs. And in particular, we don't have any proofs for the Shaw family of hash functions. Alice therefore acquiesces and decides to look at Bob's construction. Let's say that Bob's hash function starts out by building some complex permutation P and then truncates the output to get a hash function. Alice agrees with Bob that P itself seems like a pretty good permutation, but she points out that the re resulting hash function is trivially insecure nonetheless. Basically, you can invert the hash function on any output just by arbitrarily selecting the values for the discarded bits and then inverting P. This violates one-wayness and also allows for finding collisions. All right, so Bob goes back to the drawing board. Now Bob proposes first padding the input with several zeros, applying the permutation and then truncating the output. Now Alice can't find any issues with the hash function. She's willing to accept that P is a fantastic permutation, uh, but still wants to be sure that she didn't just miss some trivial attack on the resulting hash function. So she asked Bob to prove that there's no such trivial attacks. Uh, and so what Bob does is propose, proposing to use the concept of indifferentiability. So what is indifferentiability? Proposed by Maurer, Renner, and Hollenstein, it's a strengthening of indistinguishability, which is used when trying to build one idealized object from another. In our case, we are willing to accept that P is a good permutation. So we are going to model it as a truly random permutation and its inverse which is also called an ideal cipher. Our goal is to justify that the resulting construction, which we will call C, is in some sense as good as an ideal hash function, uh, which are often called random oracles. And indifferentiability is a way to formalize this goal of justifying a construction is as good as a random oracle. Indifferentiability is defined by the picture here. The adversary is given two interfaces. One corresponds to the building block, in our case, an ideal permutation is inverse depicted here. The second corresponds to the desired object we are trying to construct, in our case, a hash function, which is depicted on the bottom here. Differentiability then defines two worlds, real and ideal. The real is depicted on the left, where the um, building block oracle um, is the ideal cipher, and the hash function is set to be the construction which makes queries to the building block. The ideal world is given on the right, where the hash function is set to be a truly random oracle, and queries to the cipher are answered via a simulator, which can uh, make queries to the random oracle in order to help it answer the queries. Importantly for this talk, the uh, simulator will be allowed to keep state between the queries. Indifferentiability requires that for every adversary, there exists a simulator that causes these two worlds to be indistinguishable. So indifferentiability can be seen as a form of universal composability for idealized objects. And indeed, Maurer et al. show that indifferentiability composes well, uh, that if you construct uh, one indifferentiable object from another indifferentiable object, the final object is in fact different, indifferentiable. And they also show that indifferentiability implies security for what are called single stage games. These are games making up the most of cryptography where a single adversary interacts with the challenger. So for now on, I will call this result the M or H composition theorem. Because of these nice properties of indifferentiability, 
And because many hash functions are built from lower level building blocks, proof of indifferentiability have become a popular way to justify that a new construction at least doesn't have trivial attacks. And many popular constructions have indifferentiability proofs such as Merkle dam guard and the sponge construction. With a major caveat that I will discuss in a moment, the, an indifferentiability proof shows that the hash function might as well be treated as a random oracle, provided we are willing to treat the underlying building block as an ideal object. So what this work is about is exploring a strengthening of indifferentiability called reset indifferentiability, which is needed to overcome a significant limitation in plain indifferentiability. Concretely, as observed by Ristenpart, Shacham, and Shrimpton, indifferentiability is insufficient for what are called multi-stage games. These are games where there are actually two or more different adversaries, each interacting with the challenger. Importantly, the adversaries are not allowed arbitrary communication between them. Uh, maybe they're fully isolated or perhaps some minimal communication is allowed. Examples of Games that are multi-stage include deterministic encryption, key-dependent message security, leakage resilience, and others. As Rist and Part et al. observe, the fact that the plain indifferentiability simulator is a lot is allowed state causes problems for indifferentiability in the multi-stage setting. Basically, since both adversaries will carry the same simulator and that simulator is keeping state between its queries, the state of the simulator breaks the isolation between the adversaries. And what this means is that the MRH composition theorem actually fails for multi-stage games. To remedy this issue, Rist and Part et al. propose a notion called reset indifferentiability. Uh, and this is exactly identical to plain indifferentiability, except that the simulator now is required to be stateless. They then prove what I'll call the RSS composition theorem, showing that reset indifferentiability composes and implies security for general potentially multi-stage games. Um, they even show that this characterization is tight, namely that if you don't have reset indifferentiability, then there must exist some game where security fails. Unfortunately, reset indifferentiability itself has a major limitation. Wisdom part at all prove an impossibility, which was later refined and strengthened by several follow-up works, showing that domain extension is impossible under reset indifferentiability. Domain extension is just taking any small domain ideal object like a small random oracle and constructing a large domain object such as a, as a big random oracle or even a random oracle with an unbounded domain, um, which is what you would do with Merkle dam guard or the sponge construction. Um, so what this shows is that Merkle dam guard and the sponge construction for long messages actually can't be reset indifferentiable, uh, which is in contrast to the plain indifferentiability setting where we have such proofs. Now, the, the strong impossibility seems to have basically led to, indifferenti to reset indifferentiability being abandoned, and, and there have been a few subsequent works in the area. Uh, so the starting point for this work is, is two observations. First, we observe that domain extension is not always necessary. For example, sometimes we use random oracles for deriving the coins for a public key encryption scheme. As an example, consider building CCA secure encryption using the Fujisaki Okamoto transform or building deterministic encryption from general public key encryption. The deterministic encryption example is more relevant to us since it's a multi-state game and we need, and therefore need reset to differentiability. Um, if our messages are a fixed size, then we actually don't necessarily care about domain extension as long as the building block we're starting from has a sufficiently large domain. Um, so for example, if we are building our hash function from a random permutation, say using the sponge construction, we might be interested in the reset and differentiability for very small messages. Uh, secondly, we observe that basically is nothing, nothing is known about reset indifferentiability beyond the impossibilities. Uh, prior work didn't even establish the possibility of domain shrinkage, building a small random oracle from a big one. This 
might seem crazy because it seems intuitively obvious that we should be able to just pad the input to get a smaller domain. Uh, but it was not clear that this was possible. And in fact, um, some work has even demonstrated some barriers to doing this and has left it as an explicit open problem. Another question is whether we can build small random oracles from ideal ciphers. In particular, is the sponge construction for sufficiently small messages reset and differentiable? This wouldn't contradict a domain extension impossibility since the domain remains small. And finally, what about the other direction? Can we build ideal ciphers from random oracles? This finally leads us to our work where we give several new results for reset and differentiability. First, we try to shed more light on what can be ascertained from the techniques of prior work. And concretely, we show that the prior possibility is actually extraordinarily strong. Uh, the impossibility for domain extension actually holds even if you let the simulator have an unbounded number of queries. On the other hand, we prove a general theorem showing how to achieve indifferentiability for unbounded simulators for a variety of tasks, including domain shrinkage, ideal ciphers, random oracles, uh, sorry, ideal ciphers from random oracles and vice versa. Uh, now, indifferentiability with an unbounded simulator is rather useless on its own. Uh, the unbounded simulator would, would break pretty much any application. Uh, but what these two results together show is that domain extension is really quite different from other natural goals you might want to achieve. And so there, the impossibility of domain extension really doesn't seem to apply elsewhere. And there may be hope, is hope of achieving these other tasks. Or alternatively, if we wanted to actually prove these tasks impossible, it would seem to require brand new ideas. Next, we move on to our actual meaningful results. First, we prove that domain shrinkage is in fact possible with reset and differentiability using the obvious padding construction. The difficulty is going to be in actually proving that this works. Um, then we investigate the natural approach to building a random oracle from a random permutation by padding the input and truncating the output. This can also be seen as the sponge construction for a, a single message block. We show that as long as the input and output size of the derived hash function satisfy a certain constraint, that this actually does give a reset indifferentiable hash function. And what are the what is the constraint? Basically, we need that the input size of the hash function plus the output size of the hash function can't exceed the block size of the ideal cipher. Now, uh, you may look at this restriction on the input and output size, and it may um, seem unexpected. But we show that this is actually the right answer, and it's actually inherent. For this particular construction, uh, it, we show that if you try to have the sum of input and output size exceed the block size of the permutation, then there's actually an explicit attack breaking the reset indifferentiability of the construction. And now note that this is in contrast to the plain indifferentiability setting where the padding and truncating just need to each be independently um, larger than the security parameter. Finally, we show that all of our results lift the quantum setting. For the purposes of this talk, I won't discuss this too much. But basically, stateful simulation techniques are particularly challenging in the quantum setting, where a stateless simulation is much easier, though still often non-trivial. Uh, so reset indifferentiability is particularly amenable to lifting to quantum. Um, one note is that even if you don't care about reset indifferentiability, and all you care about is plain indifferentiability, uh, in the quantum setting, it was previously open to construct a random oracle from an ideal cipher um, in the quantum setting. And what our work shows is that by going through reset indifferentiability, we actually are able to achieve such a, a result and in a way that is pretty accessible without knowing too much about quantum uh, because all of our results lift somewhat straightforwardly to the quantum setting. I'll note that there's a concurrent and independent work 
that also proves that ideal ciphers imply random oracles in the quantum setting. And in particular, this work proves the quantum indifferentiability of the full sponge construction. However, the work uses completely different and more sophisticated quantum techniques. So due to lack of time, I won't talk about all the results, but I wanna discuss what could be seen as the main results, which is building an indifferentiable, a reset indifferentiable random oracle from an ideal cipher. And in order to motivate uh, our proof, I'll actually give the, the lower bound uh, since it'll actually sort of hint at our solution. So suppose we are trying to build a random oracle from an ideal cipher by padding the input and truncating the output. And suppose the input size and output size sum together to be more than the block length. Our goal is to show that this is not reset indifferentiable. The way we do this is we actually just give an explicit adversary, which is pretty simple. The adversary first queries the hash function, uh, its hash function oracle on a random input X. Um, here I'm depicting what happens in the real world where the hash function is instantiated with the ideal cipher. In response to X, the adversary gets a value I'll call W prime. The adversary also queries the permutation oracle on input X concatenated with zero, getting a string in response that we will parse as W concatenated with Z. Then finally, it takes this W concat Z, queries the P inverse oracle to get uh, what we will call X prime concat Y prime. The adversary then just simply checks that W equals W prime, X equals X prime, and Y prime equals zero, outputting one if and only if all of these checks pass, and otherwise it outputs zero. So it should hopefully be clear that in the real world depicted here, the, all of the checks will pass. And so the probability that the adversary outputs one is one. So to give just a little intuition for what the adversary is doing, basically the checks for X equals X prime and Y prime equals zero are just needed to make sure that P and P inverse are indeed inverses of each other. Um, and that any simulator when we move to the ideal world um, isn't cheating us by setting a permutation oracle to be something trivial. And then the check that W equals W prime is just to make sure that the hash function oracle and the permutation oracle are consistent with each other. Okay, so why does the adversary break reset indifferentiability? Um, well, let's consider moving to the ideal world where the hash function is a random oracle and the permutation oracles are being simulated by the simulator. Since we are in the reset indifferentiability setting, the two queries of the permutation oracle are, and its inverse are answered independently. And I'll call the algorithms that are used to answer them simp and simp inverse. The first thing to notice is that simp inverse is given W and must produce X. But W is a random oracle output and X is the corresponding pre-image. So it seems that SIMP inverse must be inverting H on W. Remember all that um, SIMP and SIMP inverse can do is query the Oracle H. Um, and since SIM must be query efficient, this would violate the known one-wayness of random oracles. Now, this doesn't quite work as a proof since SIMP inverse is also given Z as an input. And Z could be side information which helps it invert H. Remember after all that Z was produced by SIMP and SIMP actually got X as an input. So Z, Z can in fact depend on X. Therefore, in order to justify um, that there's a problem and that this attack actually works, we need to be more careful. So to finish the proof, basically what we're going to do is use SIMP inverse to construct an inverter for the random oracle H. The inverter is given W and then just guesses a random Z and runs SIMP inverse forwarding all queries to H. Finally, it outputs whatever SIMP inverse outputs. If Z is the correct value that would have been outputted by SIMP, then we know that SIMP inverse must succeed 
as in we, we know that x prime must equal x because this happens in the real world with probability one, it must therefore also happen in the ideal world, uh, condition on z being correct. Now, since z is just random, the probability it is correct is just um, one over the number of z's, and that is equal to one half raised to the um, size of the block minus the size of the output. On the other hand, we can bound the probability of success by the known one wayness of random oracles for any algorithm making Q queries. Combining these together then gives us a lower bound on the number of queries shown here. Notice that if the input and output sizes sum to somewhat larger than the block size, this quantity will be exponential implying an inefficient simulator and therefore contradicting indifferentiability. This gives the theorem. All right, so now let's turn to our, our positive result. And the, the, the negative result actually strongly hints at how to prove reset indifferentiability in, the, in, in this case. Basically, the, the, the reason that the negative result didn't extend to all input and output sizes is because the z value could encode um, information about x. So to turn this into a positive result, that's exactly what we're going to do. Uh, what we're going to do is have sim p have um, access to a, um, we're going to pretend for the moment that sim p has access to an ideal permutation inverse, which I'll denote i and i inverse. Um, now, importantly, while this is going to actually be shared between p and p inverse, sim p and sim p inverse, um, it's immutable and cannot be used to store state adaptively. So what is uh, SIMP going to do? It's going to set P to be I of X and it'll set the, um, this, the W value to be H of X, which it actually just gets by querying the random oracle. Um, SIMP inverse then, which also we're going to pretend knows I and I inverse, um, just uses i to decode what, what x is in output x without having to break any one wayness of the random oracle. Now, there are some lingering issues here. The most uh, obvious problem is how to actually simulate i without having any state at all. You know, at least it's not um, sort of adaptive state, but it is still state and um, we can't have any state if we're going to do reset indifferentiability. Uh, and basically, we show how to overcome this issue by using the randomness in H itself in order to simulate the random permutation in its inverse. And this requires care in order to make sure that um, I and I, I, I inverse and H don't share any correlations that could be detected by the adversary. Um, the other issue is, well, we, we basically only explained how to handle the queries made by our particular attack, but we need to handle queries for all attacks. And in particular, we need to define what um, SIMP does on inputs that don't have the form X and cat zero. And we show how to do this by additionally having more um, ideal ciphers in their inverses that SIMP and SIMP inverse have access to. So this concludes the overview of our work. And I briefly wanted to discuss some open questions. The main open question is that we were unable to answer whether you can build a recent indifferentiable ideal cipher from a random oracle. If you could do this, then this would prove the equivalence of ideal ciphers and small domain random oracles, uh, somewhat mirroring what's known in the plane indifferentiability setting. Uh, another interesting question is whether there is a way to more efficiently construct a random oracle from an ideal cipher. Our, the patent truncate construction we use will lose much of the domain of the ideal cipher in order to achieve reset indifferentiability. And while we prove this is inherent to the particular construction, maybe there's a better construction out there that doesn't suffer from such a limitation. The final question is to explore other indifferentiability results which don't involve domain extension and see if they can be proved in the reset indifferentiability setting.
As this one example um, would be indifferentiable encryption, both in the secret key and public key setting, which have been explored in a couple of recent works. With that, I conclude my talk. Thank you for listening.